Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Frank Schallenberger. I'm the medical director of the uh, Nevada Center for Alternative and Anti-Aging Medicine here in Carson City. And this uh, lecture I'm going to give you is the third part of a four-part lecture series um, that is designed to uh, teach you about cellular energy production, why it's so critically important to your health, why it's so critically important to your rate of aging, what you can do about it, and in this section, we're going to talk about uh, how you can measure it. There are going to be some sections in here I'm going to skip through pretty fast because I've already covered them in parts one and two. So if you haven't seen parts one and two, let me suggest that you, you look at parts one and two before you look at the, uh, part three here. Um, so uh, the same of the series is health, aging, and disease. It's all about energy. Part one was the importance of cellular energy production. Part two was how to maximize your cellular energy production. And in this part, we're going to talk about measuring cellular energy production using a, a, a very interesting testing uh, program that I've developed called bioenergy testing. And we'll go into some detail on how that's done. And then in the next and final part, we'll tell you how you can use bioenergy testing and the results of that test to, ma uh, to maximize uh, your your program to enhance your cellular energy production and, and improve your health and sl actually slow down the aging process. Um, one, one of my favorite things I like to say to doctors when I'm giving them lectures is that practicing preventive uh, biological or anti-aging medicine without testing mitochondrial function, and as you know by now, mitochondrial function is interchangeable with energy, cellular energy production. So without testing cellular energy production is like practicing cardiology without being able to test the heart. It doesn't make any sense at all. The thing that keeps us healthy, the thing that slows down aging, the thing that prevents disease primarily is cellular energy production. And if you can't even test for that, you're kind of just operating blindly. You don't know what you're doing. So being able to test is incredibly important. Uh, and, and one of the things I like to also point out to doctors is that, you know, a lot of people think that therapy is the most important thing in medicine. And uh, I, I, would, I would at least put up for debate the fact that it's not. I would put up for debate for you that therapy is not the most important thing, that actually measurement is the most important thing. Because consider this, if you don't have a way to measure what you're doing, then you don't have a way of knowing if what you're doing is actually correct. A good example would be a blood pressure. We know that blood pressure causes disease, uh, and yet uh, we couldn't even begin to treat blood pressure. No matter how many ways we have to treat it, we couldn't begin to treat it if we didn't know that, number one, you had high blood pressure and needed treatment, and number two, if we gave you our treatment, we couldn't measure your blood pressure to know that it is, in fact, working. So that's a good example to kind of understand if you don't measure cellular energy production, you have no idea if the hormones you're giving, if the uh, vitamins you're taking, if the exercise you're doing or whatever you're doing is actually doing what you want it to do, which is to slow down aging and to prevent disease by improving cellular energy production. So you've got to have a testing method. Uh, I've written two books that I'm going to point them out to you here because uh, they deal specifically with this topic. One book's called Bursting with Energy. Uh, that is my first book. It deals with uh, energy as it relates to aging. And the second book is Type 2 Diabetes Breakthrough, which deals with energy as it relates to chronic diseases, specifically diabetes. And both of these books go into much greater detail than this lecture will on uh, everything I'm going to talk about. Not only that, they're fully referenced, and they've got all the literature references and scientific references to everything that I'm going to be saying in this lecture. Those books are available at all the major book outlets. So let's kind of real quick like go through the very basics here. Uh, this has been covered in the previous lectures, but it doesn't hurt to kind of go over them again. Uh, oxygen is converted to water plus energy. That process is called cellular energy production. Free radical damage to the mitochondria inevitably occurs as a result of that process. The longer you're alive, the more damage your mitochondria are going to accumulate. And the less efficient the process of cellular energy production is, the more free radical damage you're going to get. This accumulated free radical damage leads to mitochondrial decay. Mitochondrial decay is when the mitochondria or the energy-producing systems in the cell are actually destroyed 
permanently. Mitochondrial decay is the central lesion in the aging process and in all degenerative disease. We proved that in part one. Aging and degenerative disease is determined by your starting point, that's your genetics basically, and by your rate of mitochondrial decay. Mitochondrial decay is inevitable. You're going to get it. Ultimately, you're going to die. Haven't figured out a way to stop that yet. But what is not inevitable is the rate of decay, how fast that's going to happen. That's treatable, and that's what we're talking about. Because mitochondrial decay, rate of decay, is determined by one thing, and that's cellular energy production efficiently, efficiency. So what we're going to talk about today is how to measure that, how to know if you, in fact, are producing cellular energy efficiently. Uh, I pointed this out in the, uh, in, in, in the previous lectures. Cellular energy is different from the energy that you and I normally talk about. Uh, you know, we'll talk about, well, I'm having a high energy day or I'm having a low energy day. Cellular energy production pretty much stays the same every day. Uh, so whether you feel energetic or not, it doesn't parley out into whether your cellular energy production is high or low. Uh, you can have very efficient cellular energy production, and you can feel tired or run down. An example of that would be a world-class athlete who didn't get a good night's sleep. Uh, on the other hand, you can uh, feel very good and, and have no complaints at all and have very poor cellular energy production. So it's incredibly important to measure cellular energy production, or you have no idea where you stand. Um, uh, I'm going to just very quickly just point this slide out without really covering it. It's been covered in the previous lectures, uh, but the point is that all of these lifestyle things least lead to decreased cellular function. As cellular function decreases, uh, you have increased free radical formation, decreased free radical containment. That further increases the decreased mitochondrial function, and the spin-off is ultimately... Uh, you start aging more rapidly, and you start developing chronic degenerative disease. This process here starts when you're young and healthy. So that's the time to get yourself tested, find out if it's going on. If it's going on, we'll talk about what to do about it. So let's define. When I'm saying I'm going to test for cellular energy production, what am I talking about? What am I going to test? Well. One, there's basically four things we're going to look at. One is resting mitochondrial ATP production. So we're going to look at how well you produce, ATP is the energy molecule, so how well do you produce energy when you're at rest, when you're, when you're just sitting there? I'm basically at rest right now. So as I'm sitting here, I would like to know how efficiently I'm producing energy. So that's one of them. And, I, and we can we're going to compare it to what's expected. So if it's 100, that means it's 100% of what it's expected. If it's 150%, that means it's 150% of what's expected. Of course, we'd like it to be high. Uh, my maximal, the other thing we're going to check is maximal mitochondrial energy production. That means, okay, now I'm going to go exercise. And I'm going to exercise to the point where my energy production from the mitochondria, that means aerobic energy production, is at a maximum. And I'm going to measure that. And I'm going to say, well, what, what's the absolute output I could get? If I were a car, you might call that the horsepower. But what's my maximum energy output that I can get? And that's what number two is here. So number one is, how much energy do I get just sitting here? Number two is, what's the maximum I could do if I'm really forced into doing it? Number three has to do with fat metabolism. And that is, as I'm sitting here and I'm producing energy, what percentage am I producing from fat? And what percentage am I producing from sugar? We know that really, really healthy people produce more and more of their energy from fat. In fact, in a resting state, healthy people, exceptionally healthy people, produce about 80% of their energy from fat in a resting state and only 20% from glucose. Now, that can be different. People that aren't very healthy, they may, may, may feel healthy, but from a cellular energy production, they aren't healthy, may be producing only 20% of their energy from fat. Uh, while they're resting. I've seen p people that don't produce any of their resting energy production from fat. They live entirely off glucose. It's not healthy and it's not good, but this is what we can see. So we want to know how well we're producing energy from fat. So we do two ways. We look at how well we produce energy from fat when we're resting, and then we exercise. How well can you produce energy from fat as you exercise? And those are the four primary parameters 
that we're going to look at and evaluate to determine how efficiently our mitochondria are producing cellular energy. Uh, this is a slide that uh, we looked at in the, in the previous talks, and we went into great detail on the first two talks on this slide. So uh, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just notice, in, here's the healthy column, and here's the maximum energy production from fat. As you're moving from health to disease, what's the first thing that happens? You don't burn fat as efficiently. You rely more and more on glucose. Second thing that happens is you don't burn either one efficiently, and you rely more and more on anaerobic metabolism. This is not, these two conditions are not healthy, okay? And they can occur in people who feel great, who are, quote, healthy for their age. But they're not healthy. And then, of course, the last stage is when they're diseased. Now, this is pretty easy to diagnose. Doctors can figure this one out. But what doctors can't figure out is whether you're in here or not. It's kind of like saying doctors can figure out if you have high blood pressure once you've had a stroke. But that's, that's not what we want to do. We want to figure out if you have high blood pressure before you have the stroke so we can prevent you from getting the stroke. And from an energy standpoint, what we want to be able to do is diagnose you when you're in here. You might even feel great but you're not out here, you're not sick. So how do we know if you're in here? The only way you can know that is by looking at these energy production factors that I just mentioned. Because when you're in here, you'll be producing less of your energy from fat, or you'll be producing total less of your energy right in here. So here's the take-home message. Uh, cellular energy production efficiency is quantitatively measurable in an average clinic setting. I've been measuring it in my clinic now for 10 or 11 years. There are many clinics uh, around the world, around the country, that are using this testing process. You can find out about them by going to www.bioenergytesting.com, and it lists the clinics that have this, this technology. More and more clinics are utilizing it all the time, and so you just find one of those clinics, go in there and get yourself tested. Uh, the rate of mitochondrial decay, and hence aging and degenerative disease, is determined by cellular energy production efficiency. Decreased cellular energy production is caused by known factors that can be manipulated. So if you don't test out great, fine. If you don't test out so great, that's fine too. Because now at least we know you've got a problem, and we can set about to develop a strategy for you to improve your energy production. Keep this in mind. De decreased cellular energy production begins early, in the 30s and the 40s, and is asymptomatic. Uh, the condition I call this is EOMD, Early Onset Mitochondrial Dysfunction. And in the first part of this series, we went into this, a study on this in great detail. And finally, the efficacy of anti-aging strategies can be assessed by measuring how they influence each individual cell cellular energy production efficiency. You know, when I first got into this field, and I've been practicing medicine close to 40 years, uh, most of those years, in excess of 30, have been devoted specifically to preventing disease. You know, I thought, you know, this is, this is, this is a tough deal for a doctor. Here I am, telling my patients to do things to prevent disease, and how do I know if it's working? Well, the only way I know if it's working is if they don't get the disease. Well, how am I going to know that? Well, I'm going to just have to follow them until they die and see if they get the disease. Uh, that's not really acceptable. You mean what's going to happen is a patient's going to come in to see me and I'm going to give them advice on their diet and how to exercise and everything in order to prevent disease. And then when they get a disease, I'm going to say, sorry, I guess I was wrong. I didn't come up with the right formula for you. That's unacceptable. So uh, until we had a, measure, a way of measuring cellular energy production, we had no way of knowing if what we're doing is working. You can't just go to some study and say, look, 80% of the people in this study prevented getting diabetes by doing this, because 20% of them it didn't work for. We have to find a way to individualize and find out what program for each individual person is going to work for them. And the key to that is looking at cellular energy production. Another way of saying this is whatever program enhances your cellular energy production, that's the program you should be on. If you're on a program and it's not improving cellular energy production, something's wrong and we need to fix it. And so it's very critically important for doctors to be able to measure this. So how do we do it? It's very simple, actually. Um, 
We use an FDA-approved pulmonary gas analyzer. This, this is a device, you'll see a picture of it in a second, where you, as you're breathing in and out, this device is able to measure how much oxygen is going into your body and how much carbon dioxide is coming out of your body. And if you'll remember from some of the, uh, from the first two parts of this series, we, we, we talked in great detail about that's how your cells make energy. Your cells make energy by converting oxygen into energy and, the, and a byproduct of that is carbon dioxide. So we can actually measure that. You can measure how much oxygen is going in and how much carbon dioxide is coming out. Now we can get that data and then we can analyze it. So uh, what I've developed here is a computer driven, uh, uh, no, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, so we have the analyzer that measures the oxygen in, the CO2 out. Uh, then we have a computer driven exercise ergometer, which basically means a uh, exercise bicycle for people to exercise on in a specific rate. And then what I developed is this computer software which sorts and analyzes this data. When I first started doing this, I'd have 20 or 30 strung out feet of computer pages with a single line, four column data on it. And I'd have to sit there for hours and uh, with pen and pencil very carefully go over and try and, and determine how energy production uh, was, was being handled. Uh, so uh, after a while we figured that's not going to work, so we developed a computer program that is able to take that data in a matter of seconds, just crank out the algorithms that we need to know to be able to determine how efficiently you're producing energy. What do you need? You need an exam room. It's got to have a table or something people can rest on. I happen to use a uh, recliner. Uh, you got to have a technician. They don't have to be medically trained. Uh, but they do have to be intelligent to work well with people and have some computer skills. The test takes about 45 minutes. It's easy to do. Anybody can do it. I, sh I should say almost anybody. Uh, if, you're, if you have somebody that can't use their legs, uh, they can't do the exercise part of the test. They can still do the resting energy production determinants, but they won't be able to work the bicycle so that they couldn't do the exercise part of the determinant. So that's how, that's the basic setup. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, there's the recliner chair that we use for the resting determination. Uh, there's the ergometer for the exercise part. And here's the unit. I didn't make this. This is made by a company called Medical Graphics. And these are analyzers in here which are able to analyze how much oxygen is going into the patient, how much carbon dioxide is coming out of the patient. And then the computer here it takes all of that data tremendous amount of data, sorts it, analyzes it, and configures it, and then spits out information and just tells us those four factors that I just mentioned to you. Here's somebody uh, doing the uh, resting part. That's the device. He's breathing entirely through that. His nose is plugged up, so all of the air is going in and out through here, and this is being fed into the computer. He does that for about seven or eight minutes, and we then move him over to the bicycle, and uh, he does it on the bicycle according to a, a very calculated uh, 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 form of exercise so that we can just step by step see how well he converts oxygen to carbon dioxide as he's going through the exercise. And, and that's basically it. So, so you might wonder, well, how does it really work? How can you determine energy production simply from knowing only two things? And it's absolutely fascinating how this can happen. It's really simple. ATP production, that's the amount of energy your cells are able to make, cellular energy production. Okay, ATP production is directly correlated with oxygen utilization. <coughs> so, all that oxygen that you're breathing in only does one thing. That's not 100% correct, but it's almost 100% correct. So maybe I better say, almost 100% of all that oxygen you breathe in only does one thing, and that is that it gets converted to ATP. So, if I can measure with accuracy, with an FDA-approved device, if I can measure with accuracy how much oxygen is disappearing into your body, I can make some computations and tell you how much ATP you're making. Now, where does the CO2 come in? That comes in to further determine it, because it gets a little complicated. I'm going to show you this in a sec. But there's two ways that you can make ATP. One is from fat, and one is from glucose or sugar. Uh, whether you're making it from fat or glucose, that's where you need the carbon dioxide to determine. 
because it turns out when you're making energy from glucose, you make more carbon dioxide per unit of oxygen than when you make it from fat. So by looking at the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide, I can tell you what percentage of your ATP or energy production you're making from fat and what percentage you're making from glucose. And that turns out to be critical based upon what we've been talking about this entire lecture series. Finally, if you remember from this slide back here, this slide back here, if you'll remember, there's anaerobic energy production. We don't want to measure that. We only want to measure this. This is what health is all about. We don't want to know this. So we want to be able to make the measurement of, of energy production and stop it when you become anaerobic. So how, how are we going to tell that? We're going to tell that based upon your carbon dioxide production. Because what happens is, as you're exercising on that bicycle, your carbon dioxide production is going to go up steady. It's going to go up. 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 At some point, when your mitochondria are maximized out and you can't produce any more energy from your mitochondria, the CO2 production is going to dramatically climb up. Now, why it's going to do that is because at that point in time, the cell, since it can't make any more energy from the mitochondria, is going to start making the energy anaerobically. And when it makes it anaerobically, there's going to be this sudden surge in lactate, because in order to make energy anaerobically, you have to make a ton of lactate. So there's going to be this huge surge in lactate. And in the human body, lactate immediately gets converted to carbon dioxide. So what we see, as soon as, the cell as soon as the cell gets anaerobic, there's this dramatic upsurge in, in, um, in CO2 production. And since we're measuring, since computers measuring CO2 production, it's computing the slope that the, the CO2, is, as soon as that slope dramatically changes, it stops measuring oxygen consumption. So that's how we know that all of the ATP that's being produced that we're measuring, all of it is coming from the mitochondria, and none of it's coming anaerobically because we shut off the measurement then, simply by looking at when that curve happens to CO2. So that's how it happens. To recap, by measuring all your oxygen in, I know how much ATP you're making. To measuring CO2 out, I know two things. One is how much of that ATP is being made from either fat or glucose, and two is when you become anaerobic. And when you become anaerobic, I shut the computer immediately stops calculating, and that's how we can get all these measurements. So let's break down this down a little bit more and give you a little better understanding yet. If you don't understand chemistry, I still think you'll understand this. So bear with me. Here's glucose. Here's fat. Here's a molecule of glucose or sugar. And there's six molecules of oxygen. So when you get one molecule of glucose with six molecules of oxygen, this is what you produce. This is what the mitochondria will produce. It will produce six molecules of CO2, six molecules of water, and 36 whopping molecules of ATP. That's a lot of energy there, okay? From one molecule of glucose, 36 molecules of ATP. So if we look, as far as glucose goes, if we look at the amount of ATP you can get from a molecule of glucose, it's six. 36 divided by six is six. So you can get six molecules of ATP for every molecule of oxygen going in when you burn sugar. So that the ratio of, so if you, if you just knew how much oxygen was going in, and you knew that that oxygen was only burning glucose, you could just multiply it by six and you can get the ATP production. So that's how you can get the ATP production when you're measuring oxygen in and you know you're only burning glucose. Now, let's look at that. Uh, Fatty acid here with 23 molecules of oxygen produces 60 molecules of carbon dioxide, 60 molecules of water, and a whopping 130 molecules of ATP. A lot of energy produced from a fat molecule. A lot of energy in fat. If you look at the ratio of ATP to oxygen, it's 5.6. So in terms of oxygen, you get a, you get a little bit less ATP when you burn fat than when you burn glucose. Again, with glucose, the ratio was six molecules of ATP per oxygen. With fat, it's only 5.6 molecules of ATP per oxygen. So that's why they say the glucose gives you more energy. 
It does. More energy per unit of oxygen. But fatty acids actually give you more energy. But glucose gives you more energy per unit of oxygen. So if I knew that you were only burning fat, and I knew how much oxygen was disappearing in, I could multiply that amount of oxygen by 5.6, and I'd find out how much ATP you're making. So that's how I can tell. If you're only burning fat, I just multiply by 5.6. If you're only burning uh, uh, glucose, I multiply by 6, and I can tell you how exactly how much ATP. The problem is obvious, though. At no one time that we're measuring here, are you actually burning 100% fat or 100% glucose? So how can you possibly tell at any one point in time uh, what you're doing? And the answer to that dilemma is exemplified in this next slide. So let's take a look at this. Um, what we're looking at here is, over here is something called respiratory quotient. Now that is the ratio of uh, carbon dioxide to oxygen, okay? That's over here. So I told you those are the only three things we're measuring. And so when the ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen is 0.7, that means you're not burning any carbohydrate at all. You're only burning fat. Okay? When the ratio is 1, when there's a 1 to 1 ratio between oxygen and carbon dioxide, that means you're producing 100% of your energy from carbohydrate and none from fat. But look at this. It's a perfectly linear relationship, which means that any time in here, all I have to know is this ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen, and I'll tell you exactly what percentage you're burning. For example, if I knew the ratio was 0.85, I come right here. Whoops, 0.85 is the division point. When the ratio is 0.85, that means half of my energy is being made from fat and half from glucose. How about when the, the energy production is, uh, when the, uh, the ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen is 0.75, that means that about 18% of the ATP is being produced from fat, and the other, what, 82% is being produced from glucose. So that's what's cool, and so the computer knows this. So the computer uh, it knows how much ATP is going in, I mean, knows how much oxygen is going in, and because it can then be determined from the CO2, how much, uh, whether the oxygen, what percent of oxygen is going to fat and what percent is going to glucose, it can literally sort all that out and tell you precisely how much ATP you're making. And that's how the thing works. It's rather simple, but uh, until this date, nobody's ever actually put that together. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you learn from that. And we, we already kind of talked about this, is the total resting ATP production, the resting ATP production from fat, the maximum aerobic ATP production, the maximum aerobic ATP production from fat, so those four we mentioned already, but we can also determine a fifth thing called maximum aerobic work, which means per unit of oxygen going in, how much work does that produce? Now that's a very unique uh, determination that as far as I know, nobody's ever looked at. And what we can tell you is that is a mixture of how well you can produce energy and how well you can harness that energy in your muscles to produce power. So this takes into account not only cellular energy production, but also how, how much muscle mass do you have. And that's important because as we get older, we tend to lose muscle mass. And that th this may be the premier indicator of what rate of aging you're at. Uh, I have found that of all of these factors in here, the hardest one to get to be normal and people, as they get older, is this last one right in here. And that, that would stand to reason, wouldn't it? Also, you can get a very good uh, uh, look at what your biological age is, because your biological age is best determined by uh, how you match up, what age you match up with. So let me give you an example uh, just right now. And then in the next part, we're going to go into some, some, a lot of specific examples on how you can use the results of this test to really work with people. But I'll just give you a little example right now. I'm 62 years old, and uh, my maximal aerobic ATP production is 130. That means I'm 130% of what would be expected in a 40-year-old man. If you match that out, it comes out to my biological age would be 34. That means I'm producing 
ATP with the same efficiency as the average 34-year-old man. So I would say, based upon that, my biological age is 34. And that's pretty good, and I'm pretty happy about that. Um, it's not by accident, of course. You know, I've used the results of this test on myself for many, many years to try and fine-tune my physiology to uh, get, me, get my body to the point that it's producing energy uh, with that level of efficiency. And again, in the next part, we'll talk more about how you can actually use this data in your practice uh, to help, help your patients uh, achieve a, a very functionally and efficiently working anti-aging program. But you can also learn more, some, some stuff that's really valuable. You can learn uh, what your patient's optimal exercise zone is. Uh, remember, we talked about how important it is to exercise, but we also talked about how important it is to exercise correctly. If you don't, don't exercise hard enough, you're not getting enough bang for your buck. And if you exercise too hard, you're going to be damaging yourself. And so, you know, we published a study maybe five years ago in the Townsend Letter uh, where we looked at 20 patients who were going to gyms and receiving trainings from trainers there on how to exercise aerobically. They were based upon formulas, and uh, these, these people were advised to uh, reach such certain heart rate for such a period of time, etc., while they were doing their aerobic exercise. Of the 20 people that we checked, 18 of them were exercising way too hard for what their mitochondria were able to deal with. In other words, the trainers had used these formulas, which are absolutely ridiculous formulas. They don't work at all. They're meaningless. I don't even know why people bother to use them anymore. Uh, but trainers would use these formulas to establish an exercise protocol for these patients. And in 18 out of the 20 cases, the exercise protocol they had the people doing was actually harmful to them. Um, so if you want to prescribe exercise for your patient in a way that's helpful, in a way that maximizes cellular energy production, it's pretty critical to be able to measure what their actual exercise zones are because these formulas are useless to determine that. And you can get that precisely in each individual patient just from the bioenergy testing report. Uh, if, if a patient has any issue with calorie intake, in other words, if they need to lose weight, uh, you can know their exact calorie intake. Another, another batch of formulas that is pretty much essentially useless to figure out what is, is the formulas that are used to determine calorie intake. So what you can do is you can go to one of the books and you can say, okay, you're a male, you're this, uh, you're this uh, weight, you are this tall, and this is what your daily calorie expenditure is. It's never that. It's, it's always actually a lot less than that. Those formulas are just useless today. Don't ask me why. I'm just telling you they are. Because when we actually compute how many calories they're burning, sitting there, and or exercising, we find that it's very much different from what the uh, tables and the books tell us. So we don't have to guess at exercise zone. We don't have to guess at caloric intake. We know exactly the caloric intake. Now, many of you that are in the anti-aging specialty know that one of the premier ways to make sure that your aging, is, uh, aging process is slowing down is to limit your calorie intake. You can't do that if you don't know how much calorie you're supposed to be taking. So that's another way calories can be used, to establish a protocol of uh, diminished calorie intake for longevity purposes. Uh, what we found out, by the way, in doing this, is that almost everybody, almost everybody, uh, whether they're skinny or not, it doesn't make any difference, almost everybody totally overeats. And it's only by doing this uh, study here that you can learn whether or not you're overeating, because you can't tell by whether you're skinny. If you have a rapid metabolism, you can be overeating and still be skinny. Uh, but you can also get a cardiac output. That's very important for doctors to know. You can get a pulmonary function. Uh, so that tells you all about your heart and your lungs. Uh, we can also determine what the optimal carbohydrate intake is. How can you determine that? It's actually quite simple. If you see that resting fat metabolism is depressed, we know that almost always the, re the way reason resting fat metabolism is depressed is from excessive intake of carbohydrate. So how do you determine that? You get a resting fat metabolism. You then put the patient on a lower carbohydrate diet. You come back and retest their resting fat metabolism. If it's lower, 
you've just proven to yourself that they're taking in too many carbohydrates. And by using that technology, you can actually very easily determine what the optimal carbohydrate intake is for everybody. In other words, whether they're fast or slow oxidizer, just where are they on that spectrum? This is invaluable data to help the patients. Uh, lastly, I, I mentioned this here, there, there's every now and then we pick up somebody that has subacute hyperventilation. Uh, this can be an issue with uh, various asthma states and various anxiety and insomnia states. Uh, the test can pick that up, so whereas these are much more valuable uh, from a percentage standpoint, uh, that is a nice thing to, every now and then we pick up somebody on that. So that, that's the kind of data that you can learn. Uh, the way doctors, the way I use this in my practice is very simple. It's very obvious. A uh, patient comes in, I, I get a complete history and physical examination, absolutely indispensable for being able to learn more about my patient. I then uh, have them do the bioenergy test, plus appropriate specific testing. This would be the standard test that doctors do. Um, so when they walk in my door, I have this available to all that information we just went over. It's in my hand. I, have the, I know all about them, and I have all the other appropriate testing, like what their blood sugar is and what their hormone levels are and so forth. I immediately can come up with a treatment plan that's, that, that includes this is how you exercise, this is how you eat, this is how you sleep, um, uh, these are the supplements you need to take, these are the hormones you need to take. I come up with a very comprehensive treatment plan in a matter of minutes. And that treatment plan is geared to their cellular energy production. So there's my treatment plan. How do I know it's working, though? Maybe I didn't do a very good job. Most of the time I do, but quite frankly, every now and then, when we repeat the bioenergy testing, uh, say, uh, three, four, five months later, what we find out is it wasn't that it was approved, but it wasn't that great, in which case we kind of go back and remodify. That's down here, so we repeat it. It's not improved. We do maybe some specific testing, remodify it, and we keep going through this process until it pops out that it's improved and we're at optimal le levels of cellular energy production. And then I know that that program is suited for that patient to get the result that I want it to get. And I don't have to wait to see if they get sick because I know that we can't do anything better to prevent disease in that person than we've already done by improving their cellular energy production. So um, who should have bioenergy testing? Well, pretty much everybody. That should be obvious by now. Anybody who exercises should. Every person who complains of low energy, tiredness, or has any issues with weight should. Everybody over the age of 40, unless they don't want to develop a scientifically individualized program to prevent disease and slow aging, if they're not interested in that, well, they shouldn't do it. But everybody else, everybody who's battling a disease. Again, and I mentioned this before, if it takes a lot of energy to stay well, it takes even more energy to get well. And so it's very important for patients who are battling disease to have their uh, uh, cellular energy production tested. When, okay, when should a patient not be tested? Well, every patient you see, regardless of health status, should be tested. Doctors should ask yourself this question. When would you not want to know your patient's cellular energy production. Given all the data that's out there, all the compelling scientific information and research that points to cellular energy production being at the very core and center of why we age and get sick, why would you not want to know how your patient's doing that, or yourself for that matter? The outcome of all diseases is improved by the enhancement of mitochondrial function. The, the thousands of studies that point this out. All-cause mortality has been shown in a number of studies to be decreased by maximizing cellular energy production. And all successful prevention and anti-aging programs have to be based upon optimal cellular uh, energy uh, production. So when would you, should a patient not be tested? I can't think of an incidence except for maybe an acute heart attack or some reason why they can't exercise, and even then they can do the resting part of it. So the take-home message here, EOMD, which is a decrease in cellular energy production, is it's for real. This happens early, when you're young. It happens commonly in so-called healthy individuals. You won't know it just by looking at your symptoms or your lab tests. It causes premature aging, degenerative disease, all-cause mortality. 
It can be diagnosed easily and accurately using this testing process. It can be reversed. That's the best part. Why diagnose it if you can't do anything about it? And it is important in the treatment of all diseases. So um, that, that's the end of this uh, section. We have one more section to this lecture series. It's going to be part four. And it's going to be how to use bioenergy testing results, the thing we just talked about, to maximize uh, health and to slow down aging. And we're going to actually go through some case examples and work our way through how to interpret the information and what it leads uh, doctors to be able to do. Uh, so until then, I'll see you.